Hi everybody out there and welcome back or welcome at all on my YouTube channel and welcome being with me in my musings about Johann Sebastian Bach's Art of Fugue. Hopefully the second episodes find you well and healthy and uh, we've a lot of stuff to talk about today so <laughs> yes Grab your coffee and let's jump into our topic. In our opening video, we talked about the as I see so the imbalancing between the multiple assumptions about what Bach could have thought and the disenchanted lack of appropriate handwritten sources. Short survey of what you might expect today. In this episode I'll speak about the philological basic and from here about my ideas referring to the open end of the yeah, unfinished version of Bach's Art of Fugue. Many of my thoughts are congruent with authors like Schleuning, Wiemer, Breik or Butler. And at the end, I'll give you my approach to the fragment. The contrast against my view will be discussed in the next episode. So, for this video, I like to make two short assumptions and I truly hope you may agree with them. First, in our today's discussion, I will completely refrain from any number Kabbalah or number mythology or something else, as long as we have no written source from Bach himself. First and second, Instead, I approach to Bach's score with inner musical form principles. Hopefully, you may share this. So, we are in mid of our discussion. From the philological side of Bach, of Bach's Art of Fugue, which original documents do we really have in hands? I hold this part short and without explanation. I assume most of you know about these basics, but here just for remembrance. From a philological point of view, we have first of course the main autograph of Art of Fugue, archived under signature P200 um, in Berliner Staatsbibliothek. Um, then inside this P200 we have three appendices. First contains the augmentation canon, the second contains the uh, um, two upsichord version from the Three Voices Mirror Fugue, and the third one contains the famous unfinished fragment. Um, what else? We have the first printed edition from Heinrich Schübler in Zeller of Art of Fugue, and beyond this uh, uh, 1080 BVV, um, we have other scores from late Bach as well. Yes, and maybe the last one, um, we know some biographical glimpses from Bach's last years. Okay, from Bach's side, that's it. Okay, are there testimonials about the art of Fugue from his uh, contemporaries? Yes. We have the Necrolog by Christoph, uh, by, by, by Friedrich Agricola and Emanuel Bach. And we have uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Marburg's forward inside the printed edition of Art of Fugue. And that's from here. So, based on these philological sources, what can we know about the structure Bach himself gave the Art of Fugue? Let explore the contrapunti 1 to 11 first. Comprehensive reason, every single note there is written by Johann Sebastian Bach. No room for interpretation so far. So, here we may be pretty sure about the following. The entire art of Yuki is D minor, of course. 
all its movements are based on one main theme, of course as well. This main theme underlies a morphing process, means its shape changes from movement to movement. We have the first examples here in the background. So, the single fugues are collected and bound into groups according to contrapuntal categories. In a glance here and in graphics, group 1 contains four single fugues based on original and inverted main theme. Group 2, this are the contrapunti 5 till 7, uh, this group contains augmentation and diminution fugues. Accessing all contrapuntal yes, well, tools Bach used in the previous group 1. And then group 3 uh, contains the contrapunti 8 to 11. This group contains double and triple fugues, again accessing everything in contrapuntal tools Bach introduced in previous groups. So, next, the compositorial complexity increases. This is the consequence of the growing toolbox while grouping in contrapuntal categories. So, still regarding to contrapunti 1 to 11, yeah, in this first half, um, no single fugue there contains more than 190 bars. I've showed, uh, I've written the, the bars in the boxes here in the graphics. Um, and we know for sure, relatively sure, I think, uh, in group 3, the triple fugues frame the double fugues. Okay, let's go further. Next, let's have a look on the movements beyond Contrapunctus 11 we find in P200. These movements are two mirror fugue, or the two mirror fugues in four and in three voices. And uh, with a look on first edition, probably in this order. Then we have four canons and we have at least the unfinished triple fugue, also a 3 soggetti, which is a fragment. Let's mention three further pieces in 200 and first printed edition justify them as obsolete. Um, this is the short duplicate of Contrapunctus 10. This is the transcription of Contrapunctus 13 in Appendix 2 for two harpsichords. In substance, this is a doublet of uh, the uh, three voiced mirror fugue. And then we have the choral bearbeitung for Dein Thron trete ich hier mit in G major. This is an extra for subscribents because of the open-ended fragments. And, and the choral has nothing to do with the art of fugue itself. And I agree with most musicologists and ignore these pieces from now. Okay, then. The valued portfolio for our art of fugue so far on a glance. Here, Contrapunti 1 to 11, four mirror fugues into pairs, four canons and one fragments. These are 20 movements in summa. Going further. Now we are prepared to talk about the structure of the entire art of fugue. And now taking the fugues beyond Contrapunctus 11 into account and having all the above points in mind. Okay, if we are right, assuming that Bach organizes his material first in groups and second in an order of ascending contrapuntal complexity, then both of these principles would be satisfied by continuing with the mirror fugues after Contra punctus 11. And with these mirror fugue pairs, we add four single movements, also two rectus and inversus pairs. The size of four single movements matches perfectly to the previous groups, and most authors agree here. What's to do with the canons? <laughs> 
lots of commercial CD recordings out there spreading them throughout the other contrapunkti. However, this destructs Bach's organization principles. And so most contemporary authors recommend the canons as one group. The arguments against such a canon group is stuff for the next episode. But the contrapuntal strictness of a canon may be seen as a further essence of compositorial complexity and indeed I do so. As an own canon category, a new group seems to be adequate to Bach's structure principles we have seen so far. Okay, and if you agree, then we'll end up with the fifth group of canons. And a sixth group containing just one lonely fragment, which is now left over. That's where the fun begins and the enigmas. The fragment as a fugue for itself, a single fugue. And the second, the fragment as one movement out of many and as just a part of the art of fugue which is a much larger structure. Okay, starting with the fragment as a standalone. Um, Bach left us a triple fugue breaking after 239 bars. And this fugue is structured as follows. I have here in graphics uh, three themes. First theme is uh, until bar 115, including an overlapping bar here to the second theme, which starts at bar 114. And uh, this part goes to uh, 192. These are 78 bars. Then the famous BACH theme uh, starts in uh, 193 and goes to this uh, bar 290, uh, 239 where Bach break off. Also open ended, these are 46 bars so far. Um, one of the central questions here, of course, how many bars are missing here? Let's see, the first part has a bit more length, but that's okay. It, had, it uh, has introducing an opening function. This might, this might be reasonable. Mm. Bach often uses in his works a one-third disposition. Maybe you think uh, to inventions for piano. Yeah, it's uh, one-third, one-third and so on transferring this to the fragment, the completed third part with the BACH theme should contain something about 70 until 90 bars for being 
balanced with the previous parts, right? From the last theme, from the third theme part, Bach wrote already 46 bars. So we may presume around 40 or in the upper limit 50 missing bars. This would lead us to a total length of about 280 or 290 bars, something like this. The entire fragment then would be divided in this structure here. 115 bars, the first theme, the uh, 78 bars for the second theme, for the current theme, and then 80 plus minus n bars for the BACH theme. You agree until now? Ah uh, no, you do not. Why not? Ah, maybe because regrettably all world insists of making a quadruple fugue from the fragment. And so <laughs> you are missing one theme, the main theme, probably. <coughs> okay, in this case, the proportional geometry leaves unchanged, except we should modify it from one third to a one fourth division. And this is because Bach introduced in the fragment here every single theme with its own exposition. Inside Bach's multi-thematic fugue, this structure, this structure is rare. The E flat major fugue from the third part of Klavierübung, it's the uh, BVV 552, this large fugue is one example. Nevertheless, mostly Bach introduces in his double and triple fugues um, the following themes beyond the first one bound to another voice. As you may study in well turned put piano, or uh, yeah, of course, here in Contrapunct 8 to 11 from Our Art of Fugue. However, our fragment here is one of the, most, one of the famous exceptions in Bach's oeuvre. Assuming it as a quadruple fugue, let's see what we get. Again, we have the first 100. 115 bars, also here is our metric, given by Bach as far as he had written it down. Um, we have again the matrix in the triple fugue and here, if you see it in the background, we need something about 100 bars plus minus something. Uh, and this would be balanced a quadruple metric, always, of course, respecting Bach's structure of the score so far with the single expositions. Okay, mm, that's a massive fugue in a range of somewhere between 350 or in the upper case 400 bars. <laughs> you may guess. I wrote such a fugue many years ago and then I discarded it. Probably I've deleted the file during uh, some hard drive tidy up while I'm not uh, longer able to find it. Um, doesn't matter. The problem here is such a massive score might work as a standalone fugue. But see, and now we look on the fragment as part of something bigger, this huge score blows away the balance between the existing movements. Mm, the only 400 bar fugue I know in, uh, in, 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 in literature, the, the only one is, uh, is Beethoven's Opus 106. Yeah, the, the fugue in Hammerklavier Sonate, but there, the proportional things are completely others. Why should Bach in his late years do what he had avoided all his life? The mastery of a musical form, of a musical symmetry is definitely one of the fine and subtle attributes in Bach music at all. But here, in his late work, he should have created such a 
Heavyweight Proportion Monster unsupportable from its surrounding. Hmm. Maybe, maybe Bach could have seen this long fugue as a sixth and finishing group. Also group. Well, even even a massive single fugue remains still a single work and a group. From its structure, the fragment can't be seen, neither as a member inside the mirror fugue group, nor as one inside the canon group. It doesn't match. And apart from structure, this 400 bar monster would destroy both of these groups. Mm. And um, by the way, there arises another problem. If you need a further exposition with Bach's main theme or with one of its near relatives, what for heaven's sake could you write there after Bach performed it in four quatra puncti? It's a considerable challenge for to fantasy creating here something new. Okay, however, are there any philological arguments supporting a triple fugue instead of a quadruple fugue, referring to our unfinished fragment? Yeah, at least there's one argument. Um, we have the necrologue. So, this necrologue is one of the rare, resilient philological sources in our context. Um, it's written by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and Johann Friedrich Agricola. Their necrologue talks explicitly about the second last fragmentarian fugue as a triple fugue. And more, Agricola and Emanuel Bach talking about a last fugue Johann Sebastian Bach never had written. So many authors, starting with Notterbohm in 1881, decline this passage, already here with arguments beyond all music. Bach's name in the second last fugue would be prematured, Notterbohm wrote, and until nowadays also copy him. Or they consider whether the Nicolog speaks of a partial fugue, yeah, or even a four thematic mirror fugue, which is impossible from contrapuntal and harmonic laws. Okay, first, the, the necrologue authors both were professional musicians, and they were rooted in the inner family and pupils circle around Bach. Yeah, Agricola has been pupil of Bach and uh, uh, Emmanuel Bach was a second son. Okay, second, both wrote in an official context. Simply this should have curbs at fantasy. And third, a mirror fugues. Yeah, ehrlich. Also they belong to the absolute rarities in music at all. Probably the five fingers of my hand are more than I need counting all mirror fugues in the last five centuries. So if, and again, professional musicians, yes, if they should have been referring to a mirror fugue, they would have been able expressing themselves clearly. Here you have the German original, the literal citation of the necrologue. Yeah, I, I read in German, Die Kunst der Fuge, original from uh, Bach, also Emanuel Bach and Agricola. Mm, the Kunst der Fuge, diese ist das letzte Werk des Verfassers, also Bach, welche alle Arten von Kontrapunkte und Kanonen über einen einzigen Hauptsatz enthält. Seine letzte Krankheit hat ihn verhindert, seinem Entwürfe nach die vorletzte Fuge zu Ende zu bringen und die letzte, welche vier Themata enthalten und nachgehen sie in allen vier Stimmen, Note für Note umgekehrt werden sollte, auszuarbeiten. Okay, in English, yes. Ähm, äh, seinem Entwurf nach die vorletzte Fuge, the second last few, completely writing to the end. Uh, and the note-to-note -note inversion of all four voices. Yeah? 
in allen vier Stimmen Note für Note umgekehrt werden. Note to Note Version in all four voices. As I read it, this refers grammatically to the four themes and not to the whole fugue, fugue architecture. Asking from another aspect, could an 18th century person really read this passage in the sense of mirroring a complete, a complete quadruple fugue? What's about the possibility? Later generations came up with a malignant allegation scratching on both authors' competence and then have a reason ignoring them both. However, the necrolog remains undoubtedly a philological contemporary source from well-educated musicians. And I don't think we may ignore it. Um, we have another hint, seeing the fragment as triple fugue. And uh, this hint comes from Gregory Butler. Um, the American musicologist published in, in the 1980s, I think, that Bach himself told editor Heinrich Schübler to give six pages room between the mirror fugues and the canons, whereby the octave canon is intended to be the first of the four canons. Okay, six pages. Let's see. The fragment so far until bar 239 um, will need five of those pages in the font size of Schübler's symbol set. Calculating this for the six free page, we'll get an amount of around 50 additional bars. Some more, some less. But this is the approximated limit before the six page is filled. 50 additional bars are absolutely not enough to build up a quadruple fugue from the fragment. Always assumed, of course, we respect the structure Bach had written so far. On the other hand, these about 50 missing bars are perfect size to conclude the existing fragment as a sufficient triple fugue. Okay, are Butler's research results right? Naja, authors are discordant in this point. Moroni and Wright agree, Rechtsteiner and Daniel discards them. <laughs> so what? Okay, Rech Rechtsteiner's arguments will get their room in the next episode. Here, we should speak about another question which occasionally arises. Had Bach intended a great finale in the sense of Beethoven or later, or alternatively said, from point of musical cornerstone, a two-voiced canon, how complex ever, seems insufficient as an ending, especially after the large dimension triple fugue in Contrapunctus 11. But if the art of fugue is intended as encyclopedic or educational work only, then Bach potentially had no urge to create a great finale. Hmm? What do you think? Hmm. Let's have a look over the later works Bach's. Indeed, there we'll find cyclic forms as well as finales. The uh, triple fugue in E flat major, Bach Werke Verzeichnis 552, I mentioned earlier, has in context of the third part of Klavierübung definitely a finale effect. In addition, with the appropriate prelude, it's a messy frame around the choral arrangements between. Similar may be said for the Ricciacara uh, three and uh, also in three and in six voices from musical offering. Then the Goldberg variations are built in a cyclic structure as the aria frames the entire work. And the begin is the same as the end. It's the rubro snake. The Symbolum Nicenum 
from the mass in B minor contains both a final chorus in full orchestration, yeah, the confite or leading in uh, expecto resurrectionem, and but this orchestrated great chorus uses the same Gregorian chant the first credo chorus had begun with. In this Gregorian cantus, the end of the symbolum touches its begin. Okay, and in my mind, referring to Art of Hugh, Bach have had both in mind. The fall back in the end to the main theme in its original shape brings up a kind of cycle structure. And while embedded into a quadruple fugue, the theme is part of the final cornerstone of the entire structure. And um, for writing just and only a school encyclopedia, Bach is too much musician. I should come to an end for today, but just one last thing. My score, my own score here, um, closes not in tonica, but in the fifth, which is here a major, of course, in the D minor key. I do so in order to connect the octave canon immediately. By the way, the idea is adapted from Bach himself. In the first version of Art of Fugue from about 1746, um, Bach concluded the third contrapuntus, a simple fugue, in A major. The following fourth fugue is based on the inverted theme and this starts with the note A and connects smoothly to the final chord from the previous contrapuntus. You will see Bach's autograph here. The recording is with Ulrich Böhme in Kloster Basilica Otto Beuer. same scenario with the octave canon. It starts with the tone A and so a closing cadence to A major in the previous fragment would lead seamlessly into this canon. Okay, in my version the main theme comes up indeed pretty exactly in the very position where it would have here inside a quadruple fugue. However, none of the canons presents the main theme in its original shape. But if, but if, if the fragment in Tre Soggetti would have a greater sister in Four Soggetti, and if this greater sister would be placed behind the augmentation canon, then we could bind all these six movements together to a fifth group where two multi-semantic fugues frame the four canons. And if this framing remind you to something, yes, that this would have the same structure as the third group. And well, our imaginary fugue sister could indeed be the homeland for the main theme in its very original shape. The massive size of this last supposed group has two eligibilities so far. First, um, it's together with the mirror fugue group, the balance 
to the first three groups. And the canons framed between their multi-semantic fugues are six movements which fit together as a last group perfectly to the aspect of increasing complexity we have found in the fundamentals of Bach's architecture. Whew, okay, enough for the moment and here's my version amending the fragment as a triple fugue. I have at least added 50 bars which I do not analyze here. You will have the score while hearing it in a moment. Mm. Um, but summing up pros and cons before starting our concert. First the pros and well there seems a lot of them in my perception. Also my version keeps all movements, including the mirror fugue, in the order most musicians accept as going back to Bach. So then, um, it preserves Bach's group organization. And it preserves the criteria of ascending complexity. The imaginary group 5 would refer to the bracket construct of group 3, multi-semantic fugues embracing smaller fugues or canons. Then my, my version matches to Nikrolog's messages and it matches to Gregory Butler's results. My approach avoids, avoids an oversized unproportional single placed monster block of more than 250 bars. And it avoids the necessity for a fifth fugue exposition with Bach's main theme or with one of its near, its near relatives. Yeah. If I don't uh, choose uh, the single exposition um, form from Bach, and I won't do this. And um, my version avoids any kind of numeric Kabbalah and best wishes to our dear brother William. <laughs> no entities are multiplied beyond necessities. Okay, and the cons? Contrast, yes, I see one, but a huge one. We are running out of, well, Bach. There is simply no single note left from Bach's hand even for creating a little manuet, not to mention for reconstructing a massive, super complex quadruple fugue with all its inversions and stratos. Also, you see, there's a little fun left for next episodes. And if you like, we'll meet us then. Have a wonderful day, stay healthy and all the best for everybody out there. And at least and finally, here is my approach for the, uh, to the fragment, starting from the BACH theme in bar 193, from the fragment A tre soggetti, why Bach, why Bach scores ends with the tenor in bar 239. Okay, have fun and bye bye.